The Phantom Passenger. Jake Ghost Turner was known among truckers for his fearless attitude and love for long, solitary hauls. He'd earned his nickname not just for his preference for the night shift, but for the eerie luck that seemed to follow him. He was never caught in traffic, always dodged the worst of the weather, and never once had a breakdown in over 20 years on the road. But as they say, if you tempt fate long enough, eventually it catches up with you. It was a late December night, and Jake was on his way to deliver a load of Christmas goods to a distribution center in Colorado. The weather report had warned of a snowstorm moving in, but Jake wasn't worried. He'd driven through worse and always come out the other side. The road was empty as he cruised down a remote highway, the snow already beginning to fall in thick, heavy flakes that danced in his headlights. The CB radio crackled to life, and Jake heard the familiar voice of his friend, Eddie, who was hauling a load a few miles behind him. Hey, ghost, you got eyes on this snow? It's coming down like a blizzard back here, Eddie's voice crackled through the static. Jake smiled and picked up the receiver. Ain't nothing I can't handle, Eddie. You just keep that rig of yours steady. I'll see you on the other side. Eddie laughed, but there was an edge of nervousness in his voice. Yeah, well, don't go picking up any hitchhikers out there. You know the stories. Stories are just that. Stories, Jake replied, shaking his head. I'll keep my eyes on the road and my foot on the gas. They signed off, and Jake settled back into the rhythm of the drive, the steady hum of the engine and the hypnotic swirl of snow around him. He'd driven this route dozens of times and knew every landmark, every curve in the road. But tonight, something felt off. The snow seemed thicker, the darkness deeper, and the road ahead seemed to stretch on endlessly, as if the landscape itself had shifted. An hour passed, maybe two, and the storm intensified. The snow was now coming down in blinding sheets, and visibility was near zero. Jake gripped the wheel tighter, his eyes straining to see the road through the thick curtain of white. The radio was silent, just a faint hiss of static as the storm blocked out all signals. Suddenly, out of the corner of his eye, Jake saw something, a figure standing on the side of the road, barely visible in the swirling snow. His heart skipped a beat. It was a woman, dressed in a long coat, her hair whipping around her face in the wind, she had her thumb out, trying to hitch a ride. Jake frowned. What kind of person would be out in this storm, miles from anywhere? He was about to drive past when the strangest feeling washed over him, compelling him to stop. He wasn't the type to pick up hitchhikers, but something about this woman felt different, familiar even. Against his better judgment, Jake eased the truck to a stop a few yards ahead of her. He leaned over and pushed open the passenger door, the cold air rushing in. Need a lift? He called out, squinting into the blizzard. The woman didn't answer right away. She seemed to glide toward the truck, her movements almost too smooth, too effortless for someone battling the elements. When she reached the door, she climbed in without a word, pulling the door shut behind her. Jake glanced at her as she settled into the seat, brushing snow from her hair. She was pale, almost ghostly, with piercing blue eyes that seemed to look right through him. Her clothes were old-fashioned, like something out of the 1950s, but there was no sign of snow on them, despite the storm. Where are you headed? Jake asked, trying to sound casual, though his heart was racing. Just up the road? She replied softly, her voice calm and soothing. Not far. Jake nodded, pulling the truck back onto the highway. He noticed the temperature inside the cab had dropped, despite the heater being on full blast. The woman didn't seem to notice, her eyes fixed on the road ahead. They drove in silence for a while, the storm howling outside. Jake tried to shake off the uneasy feeling creeping up his spine. Something about this whole situation wasn't right. He glanced at her again, and his breath caught in his throat. She was staring at him now, her blue eyes locked onto his. There was something in those eyes, a sadness, a deep, unspoken sorrow that made his chest tighten. Do you believe in fate, Mr. Turner? She asked suddenly, her voice barely above a whisper. Jake stiffened. How do you know my name? She smiled faintly, but it was a smile devoid of warmth. We all have our paths to walk, our roads to travel. Sometimes, those roads bring us back to places we've been before, places we thought we'd left behind. Jake's hands tightened on the wheel. What do you mean? Her gaze shifted back to the road. This stretch of highway, 
it's seen many travelers. Some never make it to their destination. They get lost, trapped in the storm, or taken by the darkness that lives here. Jake felt a chill that had nothing to do with the cold. Taken? She nodded slowly. Some roads are haunted, Mr. Turner. Haunted by the spirits of those who died on them. They say the dead are drawn to the living, seeking warmth, seeking to finish their journey. Jake's heart pounded in his chest. Who are you? The woman turned to face him again, and for the first time he noticed something else. Her clothes were dry, untouched by the snow, but they were also torn, tattered in places, as if they had been through some terrible ordeal. Her skin was pale, too pale, and there was a faint, bluish tint to her lips. I never made it home, she said softly. Not all of me, anyway. My body was found in a ditch not far from here. But my soul, my spirit, it's still traveling, still looking for someone to take me home. Jake's blood ran cold as the realization hit him like a freight train. This wasn't a living woman sitting beside him. This was a ghost. He'd heard the stories, the tales of phantom hitchhikers on lonely roads, but he'd never believed them. Not until now. The truck's radio crackled back to life, a faint voice cutting through the static. It was Eddie, his voice frantic. Ghost, you there? You need to turn around, man. There's something wrong with that stretch of road up ahead. A snowplow driver just reported seeing a woman. The radio cut out again, lost in the storm. Jake's mind raced. He needed to get away to escape this nightmare. But when he looked at the woman, she was smiling again, a sad, knowing smile. It's too late to turn back, she said gently. We're almost there. Jake's hands trembled on the wheel as the truck rounded a bend. In the distance, through the blinding snow, he saw something. A wrecked car, half buried in a snowdrift on the side of the road. And beside it, the faint outline of a cross, marking the spot where someone had died. The truck's headlights illuminated the scene, and Jake's breath caught in his throat. The car was an old model from the 1950s, its metal twisted and rusted with age. The cross was weathered, nearly illegible, but he could just make out the name on it. Martha Sinclair. He looked at the woman, his heart pounding in his chest. Is that? She nodded, her eyes filled with that same deep sorrow. My name was Martha. I was coming home from a Christmas party when I crashed. I didn't make it. But now, thanks to you, I'm finally home. Jake's vision blurred as tears welled up in his eyes. He didn't know why, but he felt a deep sense of relief mixed with overwhelming sadness. He had brought her home, helped her finish her journey, but as the realization sank in, so did the fear. He looked back at the road and the truck began to slow down, almost as if it were on its own. The storm outside seemed to ease, the wind dying down to a whisper. The snow stopped falling, leaving the world eerily still. And then, as suddenly as she had appeared, Martha was gone. The passenger seat was empty, no sign she had ever been there. The air inside the cab warmed up again, the heater finally doing its job. Jake pulled over to the side of the road, his hands shaking as he put the truck in park. He sat there in silence, his heart pounding, trying to process what had just happened. He had heard the stories, but he had never imagined they were true. But now, as he looked back at the cross by the wrecked car, he knew better. Some spirits were real, and they were still out there, walking the lonely roads, searching for someone to help them find their way home. Jake wiped his eyes and took a deep breath, then picked up the CB radio. Eddie, you there? The radio crackled to life, Eddie's voice sounding relieved. Yeah, ghost, I'm here. You okay? What the hell happened? Jake glanced at the empty passenger seat, then back at the road ahead. I... I think I just gave someone a ride home. There was a long pause on the other end. The other end. The Midnight Hitchhiker. Jake Weston had been driving the same stretch of highway for over a decade. The long hauls kept his life simple. Just him, his 18-wheeler, and the open road. He had seen it all. Icy roads, thunderstorms, even the odd UFO sightings some drivers swore by. But nothing, not even the wildest tales from fellow truckers could prepare him for what he encountered one fateful night on Route 66. It was just past midnight, and the road was shrouded in thick fog, making visibility nearly impossible. Jake's headlights cut through the mist, revealing the lonely, desolate highway stretching out before him. His truck's engine rumbled like a beast in the night, the only sound keeping him company. Then he saw it, a figure standing by the side of the road, barely visible through the fog. Jake slowed down, 
squinting through the windshield. It was a woman, drenched from head to toe, her long black hair clinging to her face. She raised a trembling hand, signaling for him to stop. Jake hesitated. His gut told him to keep driving, but something about the woman's desperate appearance tugged at him. He pulled over and rolled down the passenger window. Need a ride, he called out. The woman nodded, shivering. Jake unlocked the door and she climbed in without a word, her wet clothes soaking into the seat. She didn't make eye contact, just stared straight ahead. Where are you headed? Jake asked, trying to break the silence. Just down the road, she whispered, her voice barely audible over the hum of the engine. Jake nodded and put the truck in gear. The woman's presence was unsettling but he told himself it was just the isolation of the highway playing tricks on his mind. He kept his eyes on the road, trying to shake off the creeping unease that crawled up his spine. They drove in silence for miles, the fog thickening with each passing minute. The woman never spoke, never moved, just sat there like a statue. Jake glanced at her from the corner of his eye, but she remained still, her face obscured by her hair. So what were you doing out there all alone, he asked, his voice sounding unnaturally loud in the confined space of the cab. She turned her head slowly to face him, her eyes wide and hollow. I was waiting. Jake felt a chill run through him. Waiting for what? Her lips curled into a faint smile. For you. Jake's heart skipped a beat. He forced a laugh, trying to hide his discomfort. Well, you got me. Where should I drop you off? The woman didn't answer. Instead, she reached into the pocket of her soaked coat and pulled out a small, rusted locket. She held it out to him, her hand trembling. Take it, she said, her voice trembling as well. Jake hesitated before reaching out to take the locket. It felt cold in his hand, unnaturally so. He opened it, revealing a faded photograph of a young girl with the same dark hair and haunting eyes as the woman beside him. This, this your daughter? Jake asked, though he already knew the answer. The woman nodded slowly, tears welling up in her eyes. She's waiting too. Jake's grip on the steering wheel tightened. Waiting for what? The woman's eyes locked onto his, and for the first time, Jake noticed the deep, dark circles under them, the gauntness of her face, the unnatural pallor of her skin. She's waiting for me to come home, she whispered. Suddenly, the truck's radio crackled to life, blaring static before a voice cut through, a frantic, desperate voice. Anyone out there on Route 66, be advised. There's been a report of a missing woman last seen near mile marker 237. She's been missing for three days, and authorities believe she might be in distress. If you see her, do not pick her up. I repeat, do not pick her up. She's, she's not what she seems. Jake's blood ran cold. Mile marker 237 was just a few miles back. He glanced at the woman beside him, and his heart nearly stopped. Her once dark hair had turned a ghostly white, and her eyes, those hollow, empty eyes, bored into his soul. He slammed on the brakes, the truck skidding to a halt on the deserted highway. Get out, he shouted, his voice trembling with fear. The woman didn't move. She just stared at him, her expression unreadable. I can't leave, she said softly, not until I find her. Jake fumbled with the door handle, desperate to escape, but his hand wouldn't cooperate. It was as if some unseen force was holding him in place. The woman leaned closer, her breath cold against his skin. She's lost, just like me, she whispered. And you, you can help us find her. Jake's vision blurred, the world around him spinning. The last thing he saw before everything went dark was the woman's pale, ghostly face, her eyes filled with an otherworldly hunger. When Jake awoke, he was slumped over the steering wheel, the morning sun breaking through the dissipating fog. His truck was parked on the side of the road, the engine silent. He glanced around frantically, but the woman was gone. The passenger seat was empty, save for the small rusted locket lying where she had sat. Jake's hands trembled as he picked up the locket. The photograph inside had changed. It now showed two figures, both the young girl and the woman, their faces twisted into haunting smiles. With shaking hands, Jake threw the locket out the window and floored the accelerator, desperate to leave the cursed stretch of highway behind. But as he drove, a single thought gnawed at the back of his mind, a question he couldn't shake. What if the woman wasn't the one who had been waiting? What if he was? He was. The Haunting of Crater Road. 
Tom Big Red Jenkins was a seasoned trucker with a reputation for bravery on the road. For nearly two, two decades, he'd driven through every kind of weather, hauled freight across the roughest terrains, and faced down more than a few road rage encounters. But none of that prepared him for the terror that awaited him on Crater Road. It was a little past 2 a.m. when Tom found himself on that desolate stretch of highway. Crater Road was infamous among truckers, a narrow, winding passage through the dense woods of the Appalachian Mountains. The locals warned of strange occurrences, but Tom had always dismissed the stories as nothing more than tall tales designed to scare rookies. The night was moonless, the sky overcast, and a thick mist clung to the trees, making the road even more treacherous. Tom's CB radio had been eerily silent for hours, adding to the sense of isolation. The only sounds were the low hum of his engine and the rhythmic thud of tires on asphalt. As he rounded a particularly sharp bend, his headlights flickered, and he caught a glimpse of something in the road ahead. An animal, maybe, or debris from a fallen tree. He slowed the truck, squinting through the fog, trying to make out the shape. But before he could get a clear view, the figure vanished. Tom's heart pounded in his chest. He took a deep, deep breath, chiding himself for being jumpy. Just your imagination, he muttered. But as he continued driving, the unease lingered, gnawing at him. A few miles down the road, Tom saw it again, this time clearer. It was a figure, standing motionless on the shoulder, just outside the reach of his headlights. A man, or what looked like a man, dressed in tattered clothes with a face that was obscured by shadow. Tom slowed to a crawl, but the figure didn't move, didn't react. Tom pulled the truck to a stop, leaning out of the window. Hey, you all right? He called out, his voice echoing in the stillness. No response. He turned on the truck's high beams, flooding the area with light, but the figure had vanished. It was as if it had never been there. Tom's skin prickled with fear. This wasn't just his imagination playing tricks on him. He was sure of it, but there was no time to dwell on it. He had a job to do, and he was determined to get through Crater Road as quickly as possible. As he continued, the mist thickened, turning into a swirling, ghostly fog that made it nearly impossible to see more than a few feet ahead. Tom kept his grip tight on the wheel, focusing on the road, but the figure appeared again, this time directly in his path. Tom slammed on the brakes, his heart leaping into his throat. The truck skidded to a stop, tires screeching on the wet pavement. He stared at the figure, now standing in the middle of the road, blocking his way. This time, the figure's face was visible, illuminated by the truck's headlights. It was a man, pale and gaunt, with hollow eyes that stared directly at Tom. His mouth was twisted into a grotesque smile, and his clothes were torn as if he'd been wandering the wilderness for days. Tom's instincts screamed at him to drive, to plow through and get away from whatever this was, but something held him in place, a force stronger than fear. The figure raised a hand, pointing down the road, as if urging Tom to follow. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the figure faded into the mist. Tom sat there, frozen, his mind racing. He had heard stories about Crater Road, a cursed place where lost souls wandered, searching for something or someone to take with them, but he had never believed them. Until now. Gritting his teeth, Tom pushed the truck into gear and continued down the road. Every instinct told him to turn back, to get off Crater Road as fast as possible, but something, some unseen force, kept pulling him forward. After a few minutes, the fog began to clear, revealing a dilapidated bridge ahead spanning a deep, dark ravine. The wooden planks creaked ominously as Tom approached, the sound sending shivers down his spine. The bridge was old, barely holding together, but there was no other way across. As Tom started over the bridge, the truck's headlights illuminated something horrifying. Another figure hanging from the side of the bridge, its body swaying gently in the wind. The figure's eyes were wide open, staring directly at Tom, its mouth moving as if trying to speak. Tom's heart raced, his hands shaking as he gripped the wheel. He could feel the weight of the eyes on him, a heavy, oppressive gaze that seemed to penetrate his very soul. And then, in a voice barely louder than a whisper, he heard it. A single word, carried on the wind. Stop. Tom's foot slammed on the brake, the truck skidding to a halt just as the bridge gave way beneath him. The wood splintered, crashing into the ravine below, leaving the front wheels of the truck teetering on the edge. Gasping for breath, Tom threw the truck into reverse, 
slowly backing away from the crumbling bridge. The truck lurched as it regained solid ground, and Tom sat there, trembling, his mind reeling from what had just happened. He looked back at the bridge, or what was left of it. The figure was gone, the mist swallowing everything in its path. Tom's radio crackled to life, the static breaking the silence, and then a voice, his own voice, came through, distorted and eerie. Turn back, Tom, it said, mimicking his own tone perfectly. This is your only warning. Tom didn't need to be told twice. He yanked the wheel, turning the truck around, and floored the accelerator, desperate to put as much distance between himself and Crater Road as possible. The mist seemed to chase him, swirling around the truck as he sped down the road, but eventually it began to thin, the trees giving way to open highway. Tom didn't stop driving until he reached the next town, his hands still shaking as he parked the truck at a roadside diner. He stumbled inside, needing to be around people, needing to feel safe again. As he sat down, the waitress approached, giving him a concerned look. You all right, Han? You look like you've seen a ghost. Tom forced a smile, but the terror lingered just beneath the surface. Yeah, he said quietly. Maybe I did. But as he reached into his pocket for his wallet, his fingers brushed against something cold, something metallic. He pulled it out, a small rusted key, old and weathered, with a tag attached that read, Crater Road Bridge. Tom stared at the key, his blood running cold. He had never seen it before, had no idea how it got there. And then in the distance, he thought he heard it again. The creak of wood, the whisper of the wind, and that single chilling word, stop. Stop. The long haul. Sam Mitchell had always loved the night shift. There was something calming about the empty highways, the quiet solitude, broken only by the hum of his truck's engine. He had been a long-haul trucker for over 20 years, crisscrossing the country and living his life on the road. He thought he'd seen it all, until the night he picked up a load from an old warehouse in a forgotten part of the Midwest. It was a routine job, nothing out of the ordinary. Sam had been dispatched to pick up a shipment from a place he'd never heard of, Danner Logistics, a company name that didn't ring any bells. The directions led him down a series of back roads, each one more desolate than the last, until he found himself at the gates of a sprawling, dilapidated warehouse. The place looked abandoned, the kind of building that had been forgotten by time, Weeds grew tall around the fence, and the sign above the entrance was barely legible, its paint faded and peeling. But a job was a job, and Sam wasn't one to ask questions. He pulled his truck up to the loading dock and hopped out, looking around for someone in charge. The air was heavy with the scent of damp earth, and a thick fog clung to the ground, swirling around his boots as he walked. He called out, but the only response was the echo of his own voice. Just as he was about to head back to his truck, the warehouse door creaked open, and a man stepped out. He was tall and thin, with a gaunt face and deep-set eyes that seemed to look right through Sam. His clothes were old-fashioned like something out of a black-and-white movie, and he moved with an unnatural stillness. "'You're here for the load?' the man asked, his voice barely more than a whisper. Sam nodded, trying to shake off the unease that crept up his spine. "'Yeah, I'm supposed to pick up a shipment for Danner Logistics.' The man nodded slowly, his eyes never leaving Sam's. Follow me, he said, turning and disappearing into the darkness of the warehouse. Sam hesitated for a moment before following. The inside of the warehouse was as eerie as the outside. Long, dark corridors lined with towering stacks of wooden crates. The air was thick with dust, and the faint sound of dripping water echoed somewhere in the distance. The man led Sam to a large crate sitting by itself in the center of the warehouse. It was old, the wood splintered and worn, with strange symbols carved into its surface. Sam couldn't make out what they meant, but they gave him an uneasy feeling. This is it, the man said, stepping back into the shadows. Load it up and be on your way. Sam frowned, looking around for a forklift or some way to move the massive crate, but there was nothing in sight. How am I supposed to get this onto the truck? The man's eyes gleamed in the darkness. It's already loaded he replied cryptically. Before Sam could question him further, the lights flickered, and for a brief moment, the warehouse was plunged into complete darkness. When the lights came back on, the crate was gone, and the man had vanished along with it. Sam blinked in confusion, his heart pounding in his chest. 
He hurried back outside, half expecting his truck to be gone as well. But there it was, sitting where he had left it. He walked around to the back, and to his astonishment, the crate was there, they, securely fastened in the trailer. He hadn't heard the dock doors open, hadn't seen or heard anyone load the crate. It was impossible, but there it was, staring back at him as if daring him to question it. Sam shook his head, trying to convince himself that he was just tired, that his mind was playing tricks on him. He secured the trailer and climbed back into the cab, eager to get away from the warehouse and back onto the open road. As he drove, the fog thickened, and the road seemed to stretch on forever. The familiar landmarks were gone, replaced by an endless expanse of mist-covered asphalt. The CB radio crackled with static, but no voices came through, just the faint, eerie sound of wind howling in the distance. Hours passed, or maybe it was minutes. Time seemed to lose all meaning as Sam drove through the fog. He kept glancing in his mirrors, half expecting to see something following him, but there was nothing, just the thick fog and the dark road. Then, without warning, the fog began to lift, revealing a small, dimly lit truck stop up ahead. Relief washed over Sam as he pulled into the parking lot, eager for a cup of coffee and a break from the unnerving journey. The truck stop was deserted, the windows dark, and the gas pumps covered in rust. But the sign above the door was lit, flickering weakly as if struggling to stay on. Sam stepped out of the truck, the cool night air chilling him to the bone. He pushed open the door and stepped inside. The place was empty, save for an old jukebox in the corner playing a scratchy tune that sounded like it was from another era. The lights were dim, casting long shadows that seemed to move on their own. Hello? Sam called out, his voice echoing through the empty diner. No answer. He walked to the counter, where a lone coffee pot sat, steam rising from its spout. He poured himself a cup, but when he brought it to his lips, the liquid was ice cold. He set it down, his nerves fraying, and decided to get back on the road. As he turned to leave, he caught sight of something out of the corner of his eye, something moving outside the diner, just beyond the reach of the lights. He froze, his heart pounding in his chest, but when he looked again, there was nothing there. Sam hurried back to his truck, locking the doors behind him. He glanced at the crate in the rearview mirror, and for the first time he noticed something strange. The symbols carved into the wood were glowing faintly, pulsing with an eerie, otherworldly light. A sense of dread washed over him. He had to get rid of the crate, had to dump it somewhere, and leave it behind. But as he put the truck in gear and started to pull out of the parking lot, the CB radio crackled to life. Don't stop now, Sam. Sam's blood ran cold. The voice was his own, distorted and hollow, as if coming from a great distance. Keep driving, the voice continued. You're almost there. Sam's hands shook as he gripped the wheel, his mind racing. He had to be dreaming. This couldn't be real. But the road stretched out before him, dark and endless, and there was no turning back. He drove for what felt like hours, the crate in the back seeming to grow heavier with each passing mile. The radio continued to crackle with strange, distorted voices, his own but also others, voices he didn't recognize, all urging him to keep going to reach his destination. Finally, as dawn began to break, the road opened up, revealing a small, decrepit town nestled in a valley. The buildings were old and weathered, the streets empty and silent. But the town seemed to pulse with the same eerie energy as the crate, a feeling of wrongness that made Sam's skin crawl. The road led him to the center of town, where a massive, ancient building stood, its windows dark and its doors open wide, as if waiting for him. Sam pulled the truck to a stop, his heart pounding in his chest. He knew, without being told, that this was the end of the road. As he stepped out of the truck, the air grew colder and the fog rolled in, wrapping around him like a shroud. The voices on the radio grew louder, more insistent, and as Sam approached the building, the doors creaked open wider, inviting him in. He walked to the back of the truck and opened the trailer. The crate was there, glowing faintly in the dim light. With trembling hands, Sam unlatched the crate and pried it open, the wood splintering under his touch. Inside was nothing but darkness, an abyss that seemed to stretch on forever. The air around him grew thick with the smell of decay, and a cold wind rushed out from the crate, carrying with it the whispers of the voices. Sam stumbled back, horrified, but before he could turn to run, something reached out from the darkness, 
something cold, clammy, and impossibly strong. It grabbed hold of him, pulling him toward the crate, toward the abyss. He screamed, but the sound was swallowed by the wind, by the darkness, by the voices that echoed in his mind. And then, with one final terrifying pull, Sam was dragged into the crate, the lid slamming shut behind him. The truck sat there in the town center, its engine idling, the morning sun rising over the horizon. But there was no sign of Sam Mitchell, only the crate now sealed tight, the strange symbols glowing faintly in the dawn's light. And the town, as silent and still as ever, watched as the truck's engine sputtered out, leaving nothing but the sound of the wind and the whispers of the forgotten. Sam was never seen again. But on quiet nights, when the fog rolls in and the roads are empty, truckers who drive through that forgotten part of the Midwest sometimes hear the faint echo of a voice on the CB, a voice that sounds eerily like Sam's, warning them to keep driving, to never stop, and to never... The Hauler's Last Run Marcus Sullivan had always prided himself on being the best long-haul trucker in the business. Known for his punctuality and his uncanny ability to navigate the most remote and treacherous roads, he was the guy people called when no one else would take the job. But on the night of his final run, even Marcus couldn't have anticipated the horror that awaited him. It started with a late-night call from a company he'd never heard of, Hauler's Freight Logistics. They offered him a handsome sum to transport a load from a remote facility in the middle of nowhere to a distribution center on the other side of the state. It was a big paycheck. And Marcus, always up for a challenge, accepted without hesitation. The pickup point was an old warehouse on the outskirts of a small town called Gray Hollow. Marcus arrived just before midnight, the air chilly and heavy with an unsettling quiet. The warehouse itself was a massive, shadowy structure, half hidden by the encroaching darkness. Its windows were shattered and the roof sagged in places, giving it an almost skeletal appearance. As he parked his rig and stepped out, a shiver ran down his spine, but he shook it off. Just nerves, he muttered to himself. The last of the evening's light faded, leaving only the dim glow of a single flickering street lamp. A figure emerged from the shadows, a man in a long, weathered coat, his face obscured by the brim of a tattered hat. He looked more like a ghost than a person, and his eyes seemed to glint with an otherworldly light. You, Marcus Sullivan? The man's voice was rough, like gravel being dragged across asphalt. That's right, Marcus replied, trying to hide his unease. Got the paperwork? The man nodded and handed Marcus a stack of forms, but his movements were slow and deliberate, as if every action was a strain. Everything's in the back, he said. Just make sure you get it there before dawn. Marcus signed the papers and headed for the back of the warehouse. There he found a large sealed crate, its surface covered in strange cryptic symbols. The crate was heavy and he could feel its weight even through the thick wooden pallet it was mounted on. Get it loaded up and get moving. The man's voice echoed from the shadows as, as Marcus struggled to secure the crate in his trailer. Marcus climbed into the cab, his mind racing. There was something about the whole situation that felt off, but he brushed it aside. You're being paranoid, he told himself. It's just a crate. The night was clear, but as Marcus drove down the empty highway, he couldn't shake the feeling that something was following him. He glanced in his mirrors frequently, but there was nothing, just the endless stretch of road and the occasional flicker of a distant light. Hours passed in silence, the only sound the steady rumble of the engine and the occasional crackle of static on the CB radio. The road ahead twisted and turned, becoming more treacherous as he ventured deeper into the woods. Then the fog rolled in, thick and impenetrable. Marcus's headlights barely cut through it, making the road ahead seem like a dark, swirling void. He slowed to a crawl, his nerves on edge. That's when he saw it a figure standing in the road, barely visible through the fog. It was a woman, dressed in a flowing white gown, her face obscured by a veil. She stood completely still, her presence unnerving in the darkness. Marcus slammed on the brakes, the truck skidding to a halt. He stared at the woman, unable to move. Her eyes, when they finally met his, were hollow, empty voids that seemed to pull at his very soul. Need some help? Marcus called out, his voice trembling. The woman did not respond. Instead, she began to move slowly toward the truck, 
her steps gliding over the asphalt like a ghostly waltz. The air grew colder, and Marcus felt an icy chill creeping into the cab. Panic set in. He threw the truck into reverse, trying to back away, but the fog seemed to close in around him, and the road ahead became a twisted labyrinth of shadows. He could no longer see the woman, but he could feel her presence, an oppressive weight pressing down on him. The CB radio crackled to life, and a distorted voice came through, its tone frantic and desperate. Get out of there! Leave the crate! It's not what it seems! Marcus's heart raced. He looked back at the crate in the trailer, its strange symbols glowing faintly through the cracks. The voice on the radio was unmistakably urgent, but he had no idea who it was or how they knew about the crate. Ignoring the voice, Marcus tried to regain control of the situation. He continued driving, trying to find a way out of the fog. The woman's figure reappeared in his mirrors, standing by the side of the road, watching him with those hollow eyes. The road finally straightened and the fog began to lift, revealing a dilapidated farmhouse ahead. Marcus pulled over, hoping to find help or at least a place to regroup. The farmhouse looked abandoned, but there was a dim light flickering in the window, and he decided to investigate. He approached the front door, but it creaked open before he could knock. Inside, the house was filled with old furniture covered in dust, cobwebs hanging from the ceiling. The light was coming from a single lamp in the corner, illuminating a small table with an old book resting on it. As Marcus picked up the book, he felt a cold hand on his shoulder. He spun around, coming face to face with the woman from the road. Her eyes were now filled with an unnatural light, and her mouth was twisted into a mournful expression. It's too late, she whispered. You've already made the deal. Marcus's blood ran cold. What are you talking about? The woman's gaze shifted to the book in his hands. That's the ledger. It holds the names of those who have taken the deal. You were chosen because of your greed. Suddenly, the room filled with a blinding light, and Marcus was thrown back against the wall. The book burst into flames, and the shadows in the room twisted and writhed as if alive. When the light faded, Marcus found himself back in the cab of his truck, the fog gone and the road clear. The crate was still in the trailer, but the symbols on its surface were now just were now just faded paint, no longer glowing. He drove in silence, his mind reeling from the encounter. He reached the distribution center just as dawn was breaking, uh, the first light of morning casting a golden glow over the facility. Marcus unloaded the crate, his hands trembling. The workers took it without question, and Marcus quickly got back into his truck, eager to leave. As he drove away, he glanced in the rearview mirror and saw the woman standing by the roadside, her eyes following him as he disappeared into the distance. He knew then that the deal was done, that he had been marked by forces beyond his understanding. Marcus never took another job after that night. He left the trucking world behind, haunted by the memories of the fog, the woman, and the crate that had changed his life forever. Every so often he would hear a whisper on the wind, a reminder of the deal he had made, and he would shiver, knowing that the darkness had claimed a part of him that would never be returned. The Phantom Truck Stop Jim Hawkins had always prided himself on being a reliable trucker, the kind of guy who could handle any load and find his way through the darkest corners of the country. But he had never encountered a route quite like this one. It was his first time running a delivery through the remote regions of northern Maine. And the job seemed straightforward enough. Pick up a shipment from a little-known warehouse and deliver it to a small town called Pinewood. The journey began well enough. Jim cruised through the winding roads, his truck's headlights cutting through the darkness. But as the night wore on, the weather took a turn for the worse. A heavy snowstorm enveloped the highway, reducing visibility to mere inches. Jim gritted his teeth and tightened his grip on the wheel, determined to keep going. Around midnight, his fuel gauge started creeping dangerously close to empty. With no sign of a gas station in sight, Jim hoped to find some refuge from the storm. He scanned the road, hoping for a truck stop or some sort of rest area. Just when he was beginning to lose hope, he spotted a flickering neon sign in the distance. The sign read, Pinewood Truck Stop, its neon lights barely cutting through the snow. Jim sighed with relief, pulling into the lot and parking beside a small, weather-beaten building. 
The truck stop looked as though it hadn't been used in years. Its paint was peeling, the lot was cracked and overgrown with weeds, and the once vibrant sign now emitted a faint, eerie glow. He stepped out of the truck, the cold biting at his face as he trudged toward the building. The door creaked open, revealing a dimly lit interior. The place was deserted, except for a lone figure behind the counter. The attendant was an elderly man with a scraggly beard and a weathered face, his eyes tired and distant. Evening, Jim said, trying to sound casual. Got any fuel? And maybe a hot meal? The man looked up from his newspaper, his eyes narrowing. We've got fuel, but the kitchen's closed. You'll have to make do with snacks from the vending machines. Jim nodded, feeling a chill despite the warmth of the truck stop's interior. Fuel's fine. How much? The attendant named a price that seemed unusually low, but Jim didn't think much of it. He paid for the fuel and went back outside to refuel his truck. The storm was worsening, the snow falling more heavily than before. As he worked, he couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about the place. It felt as though the truck stop existed in its own little bubble of time, suspended in a forgotten moment. With the tank full, Jim headed back inside to use the restroom. As he walked down the narrow hallway, he noticed photographs on the walls, black and white images of trucks and truckers from decades past. There was something unsettling about them, the way the faces in the photographs seemed to follow him with their eyes. The restroom door was ajar, and Jim pushed it open, only to find it was locked from the inside. He waited for a moment, but no one emerged. Frowning, he turned to leave, but was startled by a sudden crash from behind him. The sound came from the back room of the truck stop. Curiosity getting the better of him, Jim followed the noise. He found a door marked Staff Only, which was slightly ajar. As he pushed it open, he was met with a scene that made his blood run cold. The room was filled with old, rusted equipment and dusty shelves, but what caught his eye was the mirror on the wall. The mirror was old and cracked, and in its reflection, he saw something that wasn't right. Behind him, in the dim light of the room, a shadowy figure stood in the doorway. The figure was tall, cloaked in darkness, and seemed to flicker in and out of view like a bad signal on a TV. Jim spun around, but the figure vanished. He quickly backed away, his heart racing. Everything all right? The attendant's voice startled him. Jim turned to see the old man standing in the doorway, his expression unreadable. Yeah, Jim said, his voice shaking. Just thought I heard something. The attendant nodded slowly. You should be on your way. The storm's only going to get worse. Jim didn't need to be told twice. He hurried back to his truck, eager to leave the unsettling truck stop behind. As he drove away, he glanced in his rearview mirror, watching the, the truck stop's neon sign fade into the snowy darkness. The drive was a blur, the storm intensifying and the road becoming nearly impassable. Hours passed, and just as dawn began to break, Jim finally reached Pinewood. The town was small but bustling, a sharp contrast to the eerie quiet of the truck stop. He made his delivery and decided to check in with the local sheriff, hoping to get some information about the Pinewood truck stop. The sheriff, a burly man with a gruff demeanor, listened as Jim recounted his experience. That place, the sheriff said, his brow furrowing. You must have been to the old Pinewood truck stop. It's been abandoned for over 30 years. The place was shut down after a series of disappearances. Jim's eyes widened. Disappearances? What do you mean? The truck stop was notorious, the sheriff continued. Truckers who stopped there would vanish without a trace. The place has been off limits for years, but it seems the old stories were true. Jim's stomach churned. But I saw people there, an attendant and... The sheriff cut him off with a wave of his hand. Then I heard that. I've heard that before. Some say the place is haunted, stuck in a loop of time. Others believe it's the work of something far more sinister. Either way, you're lucky to have left that place. Jim left the sheriff's office, shaken but relieved. He vowed never to take a route that led him back to Pinewood. As he drove away, he glanced at the photos of his fellow truckers in the cab of his truck, each one smiling back at him, their faces frozen in time. He wondered if he would ever forget the haunting image of the shadowy figure, and if the old Pinewood truck stop would ever truly let go of those it had ensnared. He never took another job through northern Maine again. The memory of that night and the eerie truck stop haunted him for the rest of his life, 
a chilling reminder that some places are better left forgotten. The Phantom Dispatcher Jake Miller had always been a night owl. As a long-haul trucker, he was used to navigating the highways long after dark, often with nothing but the hum of his engine and the occasional crackle of static on his CB radio for company. But when he accepted the job to transport a mysterious shipment for a company called Spectral Freight, he would soon find out that some things are best left undisturbed. It was a crisp autumn night when Jake received the dispatch call from, from Spectral Freight. The company was known for its secrecy, but they offered an exceptionally generous payout for the job. The instructions were straightforward. Pick up the shipment from an old warehouse on the outskirts of a small town and deliver it to a remote location miles away. There was no indication of what the shipment contained, and Jake didn't ask. Money was tight, and he was eager to take the job. He arrived at the warehouse just after midnight. The building was a massive, decrepit structure surrounded by an overgrown field. Its windows were boarded up, and the only light came from a flickering street lamp nearby. Jake's truck headlights cut through the darkness as he approached the loading dock. The warehouse door creaked open, revealing a dimly lit interior. A figure emerged from the shadows, a tall man with a stern face and a clipboard in hand. He wore a dark uniform with the spectral freight logo, and his eyes were hidden behind dark sunglasses, even though it was the middle of the night. Jake Miller? The man's voice was cold and mechanical. That's me, Jake replied, trying to hide his unease. I'm here for the shipment. The man handed him a set of papers and led him to the back of the warehouse. There, Jake saw a large, sealed crate sitting alone in the center of the loading area. The crate was covered in strange, arcane symbols that seemed to pulse with a faint, eerie glow. Everything's in order, the man said, his voice devoid of emotion. Make sure it reaches the destination by morning. Jake nodded, trying not to let the crate's unsettling appearance bother him. He loaded it onto his truck and drove off, the night growing colder and the fog beginning to roll in. He was just settling into the rhythm of the drive when the CB radio crackled to life. Do you have the shipment? The voice was distorted and almost mechanical, sending a chill down Jake's spine. Yeah, I've got it, Jake responded. Who's this? No reply came. Instead, the radio fell silent and Jake's unease grew. The fog thickened, enveloping the road in an impenetrable shroud. He drove cautiously, the fog making the road ahead appear like an endless, twisting maze. As he drove, he noticed strange occurrences. The shadows seemed to move on their own, and the temperature inside the cab dropped noticeably. Every so often, he would hear what sounded like whispering voices carried on the wind. But whenever he tried to listen more closely, the sounds faded away. After several hours, Jake's headlights caught sight of a small, dimly lit rest area up ahead. Relieved to find a place to stop and stretch his legs, he pulled into the parking lot. The rest area was deserted, and the only building was an old, run-down diner. Its neon sign flickered erratically, casting an unsettling glow over the lot. Jake stepped inside, hoping to find a cup of coffee and maybe some answers. The interior of the diner was dusty and neglected, but a single light bulb above the counter provided some illumination. A woman in a worn uniform was behind the counter, her face obscured by a faded cap. Good evening, Jake said, trying to sound friendly. Can I get a coffee? The woman nodded slowly and poured him a cup. As she handed it over, Jake noticed that her eyes were a deep, unsettling black, as if they had been painted with ink. Nice night for a drive, she said in a voice that seemed to echo strangely, as if coming from a great distance. Jake took his coffee and sat down at a booth, his mind racing. The diner was eerily quiet, and the only sound was the occasional creak of the old building. He tried to shake off the feeling of dread that was settling over him. The CB, the CB radio crackled again, and the same mechanical voice spoke up. You're getting close. Be wary. Jake's heart pounded. He had hoped that stopping for a break might have offered him some respite, but now he felt trapped. He finished his coffee quickly, paid the woman, and headed back to his truck. As he drove away from the rest area, the fog seemed to thicken even further, reducing visibility to nearly zero. The road ahead was a twisting, serpentine path, and Jake could barely make out the shapes of the trees and road signs. Then, out of the fog, a shadowy figure appeared in the middle of the road. 
Jake slammed on the brakes, skidding to a stop just inches from the figure. It was a man, dressed in old-fashioned clothes with a gaunt face and hollow eyes that seemed to pierce through the darkness. Do you have the package? The figure asked in a hollow voice. Jake's blood ran cold. Who are you? What's going on? The figure didn't answer. Instead, he reached out with a skeletal hand and pointed toward the fog. The time is near. Before Jake could respond, the figure vanished into the mist. Jake was left alone, his mind racing. He turned to the crate in the back of his truck, its symbols glowing more intensely now. A feeling of impending doom washed over him. He drove on, the road seeming to stretch endlessly into the darkness. The fog began to lift slightly, revealing an old, abandoned warehouse in the distance. It looked identical to the one he had picked up the crate from, and an icy dread gripped him. Uh, as he pulled up to the warehouse, he saw that the door was already open. The eerie glow of the crate illuminated the interior as he backed the truck into the loading dock. The warehouse was empty, except for the same figure he had seen earlier, now standing beside the crate. The figure spoke again, his voice echoing with a chilling finality. You have done well. The time has come. Jake's heart raced. He wanted to leave, but his legs felt like lead. The figure opened the crate, and as the lid lifted, a blinding light exploded from within. The light was so intense that Jake had to shield his eyes. When the light finally faded, Jake looked back to find that the figure was gone, and the warehouse was now completely empty. The crate was no longer glowing, and the strange symbols had vanished. In their place was a simple wooden box, devoid of any markings. Confused and terrified, Jake fled the warehouse and drove away as fast as he could. He didn't stop until he reached the nearest town, where he reported the eerie encounter to the local authorities. They found no trace of the warehouse or the figure, and the area was eerily quiet, as if it had never existed. Jake never took another job for Spectral Freight, and he avoided that part of the country for the rest of his career. The memory of the Phantom Dispatcher and the, the mysterious warehouse haunted him for the rest of his days. A chilling reminder that some roads are better left untraveled, and some jobs better left undone. The Midnight Hitchhiker Earl Jensen was a seasoned trucker, the kind of man who had spent more nights on the road than in his own bed. He loved the solitude of the open highway, the way the miles seemed to melt away under his wheels. But there was one stretch of road he always dreaded. Highway 89, a lonely, winding route that cut through the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. Earl had heard the stories about the highway, tales of ghostly apparitions and unexplained disappearances, but he had never paid them much mind. That is, until one cold, moonless night when he found himself face to face with something out of a nightmare. It was close to midnight when Earl's rig rumbled down the desolate highway. The road was deserted, the only light coming from his headlights cutting through the thick darkness. The radio played low, the crackling country tunes doing little to ease the eerie quiet that had settled over the night. Earl was just about to reach for his thermos when he saw her, a lone figure standing on the side of the road, her thumb outstretched in a silent plea for a ride. She was young, maybe in her early twenties, with long, dark hair that hung in tangled waves around her pale face. She wore a simple dress that fluttered slightly in the breeze, and her eyes, those dark, hollow eyes, seemed to pierce through the night and straight into Earl's soul. Against his better judgment, Earl slowed the truck and pulled over. He hadn't seen another soul for miles, and something in those eyes told him she was in trouble. He rolled down the window and leaned out. Need a ride, miss? He called, trying to keep his voice steady. The woman nodded, her movements slow and almost mechanical. Without a word, she climbed up into the cab and settled into the passenger seat. Earl felt a chill run down his spine as she did, the air inside the cab suddenly growing colder. Where are you headed? Earl asked, trying to break the silence. Just up the road, she replied, her voice soft and distant. I'll tell you where to stop. Earl nodded and eased the truck back onto the highway. The miles passed in silence, the only sound the hum of the engine and the occasional creak of the truck's frame. Earl couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that had settled over him, a sense that something was terribly wrong. He glanced over at the woman, but she just stared straight ahead, her expression unreadable. After what felt like an eternity, 
the woman finally spoke. You can stop up here, she said, pointing to a small clearing just off the road. Earl slowed the truck and pulled over, the tires crunching on the gravel as he brought the rig to a stop. The woman opened the door and climbed down, her movements eerily fluid. She paused at the edge of the clearing and turned back to Earl, her dark eyes locking onto his. Thank you, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. And then she was gone, disappearing into the shadows without another word. Earl sat there for a moment, staring after her, a cold sweat breaking out on the back of his neck. Something about the encounter didn't sit right with him, but he couldn't quite put his finger on it. He was just about to pull away when he noticed something in the clearing illuminated by the truck's headlights. Earl squinted, leaning forward to get a better look. There, in the middle of the clearing, stood a small, weathered cross, the kind you'd find marking a roadside grave. His heart skipped a beat as he realized what he was seeing. Earl killed the engine and climbed out of the cab, his boots crunching on the gravel as he approached the cross. As he got closer, he could see that it was adorned with a wilted bouquet of flowers and a faded photograph, the image barely recognizable. With trembling hands, Earl reached out and brushed the dirt off the photo. His blood ran cold. The photo was of the woman, the same woman who had just been sitting in his truck. Her face stared back at him from the picture, those same dark, hollow eyes frozen in time. Beneath the photo was a small plaque, the inscription barely legible in the dim light. In loving memory of Sarah Lynn, 1985 to 2005, gone but not forgotten. Earl stumbled back, his mind racing. He had just given a ride to a dead woman. Panic set in as he scrambled back to his truck, his hands shaking as he fumbled for the keys. He started the engine and sped away from the clearing, his heart pounding in his chest. The rest of the drive was a blur. Earl didn't stop until he reached the next town, his knuckles white as he gripped the steering wheel. He pulled into a truck stop and sat there for a long time, the events of the night replaying in his mind. The next morning, Earl found a local diner and ordered a strong cup of coffee. He sat at the counter, nursing the cup, when an elderly man sat down beside him. The man was a local, judging by his worn flannel shirt and weathered face. You look like you've seen a ghost. The man said, a hint of a smile on his lips. Earl hesitated for a moment before replying. You could say that. Picked up a hitchhiker last night, a young woman. Dropped her off at a clearing just up the road. The old man's smile faded. Did she have dark hair? Pale skin? Earl nodded, his mouth dry. The man sighed, shaking his head. You're not the first. That's Sarah Lynn. She died on that stretch of road nearly 20 years ago. Hit by a truck on a foggy night, just like last night. Folks say she still haunts the highway, looking for a ride to take her home. Earl's stomach churned as the man's words sank in. He had heard stories like this before, tales of restless spirits doomed to wander the earth. But he had never believed them, until now. He left the diner in a daze, the events of the night weighing heavily on him. As he climbed back into his truck, he glanced in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see Sarah Lynn's ghostly figure standing behind him, but the lot was empty, save for a few other trucks parked nearby. Earl drove on, the miles passing beneath his wheels as the sun climbed higher in the sky. He didn't tell anyone else about what had happened on Highway 89, but he couldn't shake the feeling that Sarah Lynn was still out there, waiting for another lonely trucker to give her a ride. And every time he found himself on a deserted stretch of road, Earl would glance at the passenger seat, half expecting to see a young woman with dark hair and hollow eyes sitting beside him, silently asking to be taken home. The long haul. Roy Big Red Davis had seen it all in his 30 years on the road. He'd driven through storms that tore roofs off houses, outrun wildfires, and even had a few close calls with mountain slides. But nothing could prepare him for the terror that awaited him on his latest haul. It was a late October night the kind where the cold wind rattles your bones and the moon hides behind thick clouds. Roy had been driving for hours, making his way through the winding roads of West Virginia. The trees loomed like giants on either side of the narrow road, their bare branches clawing at the sky. He was carrying a load of steel beams to a construction site two states over, a job that paid well but came with a tight deadline. To make it on time, he'd have to drive straight through the night. 
Around 2 a.m., fatigue began to set in. The road ahead blurred, and Roy's eyes felt like they were weighed down with lead. He slapped his face, cranked up the radio, and rolled down the window to let the icy air wake him up. It helped, but not much. What he really needed was a place to pull over and catch a few winks. But in this remote stretch, there wasn't a rest stop for miles. As he rounded a bend, he saw something that made him sit up straighter. A dim light flickered in the distance, growing brighter as he approached. Soon, he could make out the neon sign of a truck stop. It wasn't on any of his maps, and he'd driven this route dozens of times without ever seeing it before. The sign was old, the paint peeling off, but it was lit up like a beacon. Miller's Rest. Roy pulled into the lot, grateful for the unexpected respite. The place was run down, with a couple of old rigs parked haphazardly. The diner's windows were fogged up, and the whole building seemed to lean slightly to one side, as if it had given up trying to stand straight. But right now, Roy didn't care. He just needed a break. Inside, the diner was like a time capsule from the 1970s. The linoleum floors were cracked and yellowed, the booths covered in worn vinyl. A lone waitress stood behind the counter, her back to him as she refilled the coffee pots. She wore a stained apron, and her hair was pinned up in a beehive that had seen better days. Evening, Roy called out, his voice rough from hours of silence. The waitress turned slowly, her face hidden in the shadow. Evening, she replied, her voice low and hoarse. Coffee? Yeah, that'd be great, Roy said, sliding into a booth near the door. She shuffled over, pouring the coffee with a shaky hand. As she set the cup down in front of him, Roy caught a glimpse of her face. Her skin was sallow and thin, almost translucent, and her eyes were sunken deep into her skull. She gave him a crooked smile, that revealing teeth that were yellowed and uneven. You're a long way from home, aren't you? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Roy nodded, feeling an uneasy knot form in his stomach. Yeah, just passing through. Passing through, she repeated as if tasting the words. Then she turned and shuffled back to the counter, leaving Roy alone with his thoughts. He sipped the coffee, grimacing at the bitter taste. The place was giving him the creeps, but his exhaustion was greater than his fear. He'd finish his coffee, maybe catch a nap in the truck, and then get back on the road. As he sat there, he noticed something strange. There were old photographs on the walls, black and white images of truckers and their rigs. But the more he looked, the more he realized that all the truckers looked eerily similar, as if the same few faces were repeated over and over again, just in different settings. Roy shook his head, chalking it up to his tired eyes playing tricks on him. He finished his coffee and got up to leave, but as he reached the door, something caught his eye. A photo on the wall, newer than the others. It showed a man standing beside a truck, grinning proudly. The truck was unmistakably Roy's. Same faded red paint, same license plate. And the man, the man looked just like him. What the hell? Roy muttered, stepping closer to the photo. His heart pounded in his chest as he reached out to touch the glass. How could this be? It was impossible. You should stay a while, the waitress's voice came from behind him, making him jump. Rest up. It's a long haul ahead. Roy spun around to face her, his breath quickening. Where'd you get that picture? The waitress just smiled that crooked smile again, her eyes gleaming in the dim light. You've been here before, Roy. We all have. A cold sweat broke out on Roy's forehead and said he didn't remember ever stopping here, and yet the picture on the wall told a different story. His instincts screamed at him to leave, to get out while he still could. But when he turned to the door, he found it had somehow moved. The diner seemed to stretch endlessly in every direction, the walls bending and warping like a funhouse. Panic set in as Roy bolted for the exit, but no matter how far he ran, the door remained just out of reach. The diner was alive, the walls closing in on him, the air growing thick and suffocating. He could hear the waitress's footsteps behind him, slow and deliberate, as if she knew he couldn't escape. You can't leave, Roy. Her voice echoed around him, distorted and inhuman. You're part of the family now. Desperation fueled Roy's efforts as he reached the door and flung it open, bursting out into the night. But when he looked around, the truck stop was gone. His rig was parked in the middle of an empty, overgrown lot, the neon sign extinguished and the building reduced to a crumbling ruin. Roy didn't waste any time. He jumped into his truck, 
his hands shaking as he fumbled with the keys. The engine roared to life, and he tore out of the lot, his tires kicking up gravel as he sped down the highway. He didn't stop, didn't look back, driving as fast as he could until the sun finally crested the horizon. Hours later, when he finally reached the next town, Roy pulled into a service station and slumped over the wheel, exhausted but grateful to be alive. As he got out of the truck, he noticed something strange. There on the side of his rig was a fresh sticker. It was small, easily missed, but unmistakable. A decal of the diner's logo with the words Miller's Rest written beneath it. Roy's blood ran cold. He tore the sticker off and tossed it away, but the nagging feeling in his gut wouldn't leave. As he climbed back into his truck, he glanced in the rearview mirror. For a split second, he saw the waitress's reflection staring back at him, her crooked smile wide and gleaming. Roy drove away, vowing never to speak of the night at Miller's Rest. But deep down, he knew he could never outrun it. The road was long and the night was dark. But now, he was never truly alone. Somewhere out there, in the shadowy corners of the highway, the ghostly diner waited, and Roy feared that one day, he'd find himself pulling in again, whether he wanted to or not. The Haunting of Route 66 Ben Bulldog Thompson had been driving the same stretch of Route 66 for over 20 years. He knew every twist, every turn, every diner, and every gas station like the back of his hand. The road had been his second home, a place of solitude, where he could escape the demands of the world. But there was one night he would never forget, one night that would haunt him forever. It was late November, and the wind howled through the desert, kicking up dust and debris across the empty highway. Ben was hauling a load of electronics to a warehouse in California, making good time despite the weather. The radio played softly in the background, and the steady rhythm of the tires on the asphalt was almost hypnotic. The moon hung low in the sky, casting long, eerie shadows across the desolate landscape. There wasn't another car in sight, and Ben felt a strange sense of isolation, as if he were the last person left on Earth. The road stretched endlessly before him, a ribbon of darkness that seemed to lead nowhere. As he approached an old forgotten gas station, Ben decided to pull over and stretch his legs. The place was a relic from another time, its faded sign barely legible in the dim light. The pumps were rusted and out of order, and the building itself looked like it hadn't seen a customer in years. But Ben wasn't concerned about that. He just needed a break. He climbed out of the cab and took a deep breath, the cold night air stinging his lungs. The silence was deafening, broken only by the occasional creak of the wind as it pushed against the dilapidated structure. As he walked around the truck, something caught his eye a flicker of movement in one of the broken windows of the gas station. Ben froze, his heart pounding in his chest. He stared at the window, but whatever he had seen was gone. Probably just the wind, he told himself, shaking off the unease. He was too experienced to let a trick of the light spook him. Still, he couldn't shake the feeling that he was being watched. He was about to climb back into the truck when he heard it, a faint sound like the distant echo of a child's laughter, it drifted through the air, carried on the wind, and Ben's blood ran cold. He looked around, but the highway was empty, and the desert stretched out in all directions with no sign of life. Hello? He called out, his voice rough and uncertain. The laughter stopped, replaced by an eerie silence that was even more unsettling. Ben felt a chill crawl up his spine, and for the first time in years, he felt genuinely afraid. He climbed back into the truck, locking the doors behind him, and started the engine. He was about to pull away when he saw it, a figure standing in the road just ahead, illuminated by his headlights. It was a little girl, no more than eight or nine years old, wearing a white dress that fluttered in the wind. Her hair was long and dark, and her face was pale, almost translucent in the moonlight. She stood motionless, staring at him with wide, unblinking eyes. Ben's heart raced as he tried to make sense of what he was seeing. There was no way a child could be out here, in the middle of nowhere, at this time of night. He hesitated, unsure of what to do. He couldn't just leave her there, but something about the situation felt deeply wrong. He rolled down the window and leaned out, his voice trembling. Are you okay, sweetheart? Do you need help? The girl didn't answer. She just stood there, staring at him with those cold, empty eyes. 
Ben's skin prickled with fear, but he forced himself to stay calm. He couldn't just drive off and leave her. Come on, get in the truck, he said, trying to keep his voice steady. I'll take you somewhere safe. The girl tilted her head slightly, as if considering his offer. Then, without a word, she turned and began walking down the road, away from the truck. Ben watched her go, his mind racing. He knew he should follow her, make sure she was okay, but every instinct screamed at him to stay in the truck and drive away. Against his better judgment, Ben shifted the truck into gear and followed the girl at a slow pace. She walked calmly. She was here, her bare feet barely making a sound on the pavement. The road seemed to stretch on forever, the desert closing in around him, and Ben couldn't shake the feeling that he was being led into a trap. After what felt like an eternity, the girl stopped in front of an old, abandoned house on the side of the road. The building was a decaying husk, its windows shattered, and its roof caved in. The walls were covered in graffiti, and the whole place reeked of neglect and decay. Uh, the girl stood in front of the door, her back to him, as if waiting for him to join her. Ben's hands tightened on the steering wheel, his knuckles white with tension. He didn't want to get out of the truck, but he felt an overwhelming sense of compulsion, as if some unseen force was urging him forward. He knew he should drive away, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. He stepped out of the cab, his boots crunching on the gravel as he approached the house. The girl stood motionless, her back still turned to him. The wind howled around them, carrying with it the faint sound of that same eerie laughter. Ben's heart pounded in his chest as he reached the front steps. Why did you bring me here? He asked, his voice barely above a whisper. The girl slowly turned to face him, her eyes dark and hollow. Come inside, she said, her voice echoing in the night. Ben's blood ran cold. He wanted to run, to get back in the truck and leave this nightmare behind, but his feet wouldn't move. He was rooted to the spot, unable to tear his eyes away from the girl. She stepped back, pushing the door open, and the darkness inside seemed to swallow all light. Come inside, she repeated, her voice more insistent. Against his will, Ben took a step forward, then another. The house loomed over him, its broken windows like empty eye sockets staring into his soul. As he crossed the threshold, the door slammed shut behind him and the laughter erupted all around him, echoing off the walls in a cacophony of terror. The room was pitch black, but Ben could feel the presence of others, shadowy figures moving in the darkness, their cold breath on the back of his neck. He tried to scream, but no sound came out. The laughter grew louder, more frantic as if mocking his fear. Then, without warning, the lights flickered on, and Ben found himself standing in the middle of a room that had once been a living room. The furniture was old and rotting, covered in dust and cobwebs. The wallpaper was peeling, revealing the moldy walls beneath, and in the center of the room surrounding him were dozens of children, their faces pale and their eyes hollow. Ben's heart pounded in his chest as he realized the truth. These children were not alive. They were spirits trapped in this place, doomed to wander the earth in search of the living. And now, they had found him. The girl who had led him here stepped forward, her face twisted into a grotesque smile. We were waiting for you, she said, her voice filled with malice. Ben backed away, his mind racing. He had to get out of here, had to escape this nightmare. But the children closed in around him, their cold hands reaching out, their laughter ringing in his ears. He bolted for the door, but it wouldn't budge. The children surrounded him, their fingers digging into his skin, pulling him down. The laughter grew louder, deafening as the darkness closed in around him. And then, everything went black. The next morning, Ben's truck was found parked by the side of Route 66, its engine still running. But there was no sign of Ben Thompson. The door to the old house was open. But inside, the only thing authorities found was a dusty old photograph of a group of children standing in front of the house their eyes hollow and lifeless. And in the back of the photo, barely visible, was a man who looked an awful lot like Ben, standing among them, his face twisted in a silent scream. To this day, truckers driving that stretch of Route 66 sometimes report seeing a little girl in a white dress, standing by the side of the road, her thumb outstretched. But those who stop to help her are never seen again. The road is long and the night is dark, and some places are best left undisturbed. Disturbed.